I want to start by talking about my ideology in making because I'm really coming from a place that's based on a kind of purpose-driven system. Uh, though I am somehow very invested in aesthetics and beauty and materiality, uh, I don't think about art as a process of object making. For me, it's somehow meant to be a tool for myself and my practice. And I think of this as an instrumentalization. It, it, for me, art is about the process of serving something else. So it's really a question of where is my aim. Along those lines, in terms of service, I can't really continue to think about art as a tool. I have to start to think of it as a methodology. And so I can say, I think I use my art practice to simply create the experiences that I want to have and the experiences that I want to share with other people. Uh, some people have accused me of using art as an alibi to do what I would simply like to do otherwise. And I don't find that there's much of a problem with this. <laughs> um, for me, I think somehow transformation becomes a part of the story of art and making. And um, so for me, it's sort of about conjuring some kind of state of being or exchange. My first performance <laughs> was in 2007. Uh, I spent my, my teenage years in and out of a psychiatric hospital. And in 2007, I approached the president of this hospital with a proposal, knowing that if I believe art is in the service of something, then I have to sort of ask myself, what am I uniquely capable of sharing? Uh, what is my insight? Where is my background? What can I offer? And I knew from my experience of being in the psychiatric hospital that there was a distinct lack of empathy between the people who were working there and the people who were staying there. And I thought, okay, I clearly found my way somehow miraculously to wellness, and now I'm in a position to be able to do something about this. So I proposed that I come to work for her. At first, it was intended to be a volunteer position, uh, but instead she decided to have me fully trained to enter the floor as a therapist. And so for a year, I worked as a therapist on the same unit that I was formerly hospitalized in. And I filled out progress reports on all the patients assigned to me, and also on myself. And so in that process, the central concern of my practice since was concretized, uh, which is vulnerability. If I think about art as a narrative of transformation, then for me somehow vulnerability becomes the condition in which transformation is able to happen. And I believe that if, from some kind of recognition of human fragility, intimacy is possible, and intimacy leads to transference. Transference meaning the way that two people affect each other and are permeable to one another, the entrances and exits that happen in an encounter or exchange. In the clinical world of psychotherapy of almost every kind, transference is a faux pas. <laughs> it's um, distinctly discouraged and thought of as very dangerous, but by entering into this world of the clinician as an artist with this mindset and thinking of it as a performative practice, I was able to embrace transference as actually the making process that I was involved somehow in constructing myself and in constructing the experience of others. This led me to another concern, which is risk. These were real lives. I have a real life as a, as a person beyond what it is that I'm doing. And I realized somehow then that art making was only interesting to me in so far as I felt something very real was at stake. It became a way of asking questions, became a way of experimentation and treating the world as a laboratory. So then in inquiry enters as a way of living, as a way of fabricating experiences with this question, what, what is real? And if I can hope for actual transformation instead of for some kind of artificial or representative transformation, then I have to find a way to preserve sincerity in this attempt at all costs. So I, I entered into this question of the confessional. What is the confessional? When I was working as a therapist, I was finding it very difficult sometimes because I was hearing people's secrets, their secret lives, their inner universes all the time. And I couldn't manage to set it down. You know, I would, I would leave from my shift, come home, and though I speak for the value of transference, my God, when somebody gets inside of you, it's very difficult to get them out. And this is 
why it's important, but it still leaves me with this reality of coming back to people's stories again and again and again, and feeling very helpless sometimes with the way that I could impact them or not. And I saw a bit of mirroring there, even historically, between the role of the psychotherapist and the role of the priest. The priest also is, is uh, treated as a kind of container for secrets. And I thought, okay, there must be another way. I thought maybe the problem is in the minds, maybe it's my memory that's, that's creating this retention. And so I thought, okay, maybe I can use my body. Maybe if these secrets are able to leave other people and enter my digestive system specifically, then it can bypass the mind and I won't have to remember the stories of other people, even though I'll be able to offer maybe the same sense of release or catharsis. So I started a series of performance experiments based on this idea that secrets are substantial, that they're actually material, and asked people to speak into food, uh, bread, wine, fruit, and to speak whatever secrets or confessions they have into these substances and then to feed them to me. Uh, this is a piece called Well, which was with wine. Did a collaboration with an artist named James QB at the International Museum of Surgical Science in Chicago, in which people were speaking their medical histories and traumas into slices of grapefruit and then suturing them traditionally and then feeding them to me. And then I started at the same time uh, with a series of habits, habit forming, uh, because as much as I wanted to push away from the secrets of others, I could see that there was something in the way that the Catholic Church especially was built um, that has a lot to do with secrets becoming material. So I started entering into churches and watching and waiting. I'm not Catholic, I don't come from a Catholic family. This Catholicism was introduced to me really through the world of art, through museums and through paintings and iconography. So I was an interloper, I was, I was a spectator somehow. Uh, a very reverent one, but still an outsider. Uh, so I would sit on the pews of these cathedrals and churches and just wait for people to come and light candles. And if they stayed there praying for some time, I would slowly gather the courage to approach them and ask if they wished to share the nature of their prayer, if it had an object, if it felt like maybe they would want to witness. And if they did share, then after they left, I took the wax that had melted from the candle and poured it onto these discs and collected these prayers, uh, the Stolen Prayer series. So this was in 14 churches with 32 different visitors. I don't know if you can read the text here. Yes, these are the prayers for these slides. So I built an archive. Uh, my work with the archive continued um, I was, during this time of research in Catholicism, interviewing a lot of priests to try to understand their relationship to what they hear and how they feel they serve their community by retaining these secrets. And uh, in the end, I really felt for them because I could see somehow they were being turned into objects. They lost any right that they would have to share anything that they receive. And so it really ended with them. They became this container. And it seemed unfair to me that they didn't have any option and that it was required of them to refuse any ability to let these things go. Of course, the idea is that they become a channel to God and that God receives and absorbs these things. But in reality, a lot of these priests thought of themselves as social servants beyond all else. And they really were serving this purpose for the community. And that was important to them. But they suffered from this. And so I, I wanted to do something about it. I couldn't just sit listening to these stories from them, realizing that there's something in their throat, something that's closed, and that they're people, and that people sometimes need a hand. And, uh, and so I, I decided to open a post office box, and I sent out 2,000 letters to priests across the country working in different churches, and gave them an opportunity, just offered by invitation, if they wanted to write something that they had received, to let it go so that it has a witness, someone else, they have the option. They could send it anonymously to this post office box. I would collect them. In the beginning, I was reading them, and then I couldn't anymore. I just couldn't because, of course, the things that people felt most burdened by were sometimes incredibly dark, and in the end, 
it didn't seem fair either to myself to, to be the person that ends up with, with this material. So I collected them, and I think I read, um, I, I received 158 responses that were uh, of, of the nature of reply to offer um, a continuation of, of allowing this to pass. I've received lots and lots of letters from people who were aggravated and very, very angry with me for even suggesting such a thing. But of the 158, I think I read through maybe 40 before I, I stopped um, reading them fully. I took these letters and burned them and added a bit of uh, paste, turned them into these little beads, and then shipped them to a mussel farm in China, where they were inserted into mussels and around them after some time turned into pearls. This for me had to do with the, the way that something gathers, something accumulates. The way that muscles build a pearl is slowly by layer by layer by layer by layer until it grows. And it's of course very beautiful, the same way that the vision of what these priests are able to do is very beautiful and the reality is still very dark somehow inside. So, of course then I have these pearls, <laughs> what to do with them. Um, this, is, this is what happens when you turn things into objects, right? The objects live in the world still. They persist, and so I decided I needed to find a way to share this with the public. Um, also so that this, the story or the consideration of priests in this, in this way had some uh, possibility of, of recognition in the way that I was thinking about it. Uh, so this is at the Bond Chapel in Chicago. I had a, a, a ritual there um, during Holy Week where people could come and um, basically thread the pearl onto a strand to turn it into this necklace. I wore the necklace one day for every, for every bead, so it's 158 days, uh, with this idea that every time I drew breath, every time I took water or food, every time I spoke, everything was traveling through them. And so each day became kind of this act of mourning for what felt like a real loss of humanity that I sensed from the experience of these priests. Um, it became somehow a ritual of grief. This led me to a kind of fixation with how people are treated as objects and the violence that comes with dehumanization, but also with this question of, okay, what is empathy? Where does empathy come from? How, does it, how is it made? And is it possible to try to develop a relationship of empathy with non-people beings, like buildings uh, or historical figures, um, which become kind of characters in some sort of story, or with objects? And I thought, okay, if, if, I, if I can come up with the most extreme form of a person turned into an object, it has to be a saint. Uh, even the, the reliquaries of saints, these tiny, tiny bone fragments become objects of worship and they become icons instead of um, being recognized for having been living, breathing human beings. This is Saint Rosaline. Uh, she's one of the only saints who is fully preserved. Her body has not been touched, it's not been separated. And uh, this is, this is a, I, I found her by accident while I was traveling, um, really in, in a very, very small abbey in the south of France. And she has a beautiful story that people will sit and pray to her. Um, and supposedly, if the prayer comes from a place of sincerity, she will open her eyes and look at you in recognition. So I had this feeling that she was forever being filled uh, with the wishes of others. So, First, you, you have this idea of the confession, which is about release, and then you have the idea of a prayer, which is about a wish and desire. And so I thought, okay, I, I want to try to experience this. I built a, a similar kind of casket for myself, and through, through visitation, I think both of these visitations were six hours long, people could kneel, and when they knelt in front of me, I would look at them for whatever duration they were kneeling there. And people brought offerings, the people were encouraged to bring offerings. What no one knew was that there was something happening with the kneeler. There was a mechanism attached to the kneeler so that whenever someone knelt down, um, there was a trigger with a, a machine that sent a dildo inside of me so that I was filled for the duration of their kneeling. And then whenever they stood up, it would leave and this was only ever shared by rumor in the exhibition. 
Um, it, and that, that even was accidental. It was never really supposed to be known because it was supposed to be about the kind of gaze that was produced and the kind of feeling that I had as the being there, the state that I was in. Um, but of course, these things, yeah, the curator had other plans <laughs> for provocation. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, this is also a bit about durational performance and difficulty, what I ask of myself um, and what it means to be stuck with something. This is the Pilgrim Baptist Church. Uh, my background, personally, I'm, I'm half Jewish and half Quaker, which is a rather odd mixture. This church started off as a synagogue and then was turned into a Protestant church and became um, actually the origin point for gospel music. Dorsey uh, brought blues from the South to Chicago, blended it with the hymn, and made gospel in this place. It's an incredible building by, by Louis Sullivan. And uh, it's in the South Side, it was completely ruined, disaster by fire. And because of the location of the church, um, somehow nobody was interested in restoring it. Even though it had historical significance, the neighborhood was, was too dangerous. They thought people wouldn't visit. There wasn't enough uh, energy from, from Chicagoans to try to, to restore it. So, I saw here something like a traumatized body. Um, and so I went and I spent 24 hours touching the building, <laughs> uh, trying to perform some kind of healing on it to bring energy to the place so that maybe people would start to want to see it alive again. Um, so after, as, as I was touching it, I wore gloves. I wore one pair of gloves for every hour and I don't know how many people here are familiar with Reiki, but I trained in Reiki also to be able to do this. There was something about the exchange, something about healing touch and physical contact. And then I performed a washing of these gloves uh, to ask for money from people on the street. And I just found out actually uh, a couple of weeks ago that finally this place is being restored, which makes me quite happy. I wasn't able, of course, to offer so much money to the restoration fund in the end because um, People on the street tend not to write enormous checks that can completely restore historical buildings, but uh, I, I would hope that it would at least offer some questions. Uh, Giuliana Pivato also sang one of Dorsey's songs during the entire performance. I kind of liked the idea of turning busking into a bit of a historical window. <laughs> Uh, this performance was done in the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. Uh, Jane Addams built the first settlements building uh, and in that way kind of created the community center. She's a major fem feminist icon somehow and um, in order to try to access something of her femininity and her strength and the total contradiction that these things were during her time because she really used words as ammunition to fight against uh, sometimes the very inhuman and cruel treatments, especially of immigrant populations in Chicago. I, I, and she's of course painted as this grandmother with always children around her and uh, the sort of ultimate matriarch. So I attempted for uh, about six weeks through daily pumping to find a way to make my breasts lactate. This is supposedly possible, but apparently not possible if anybody is under stressful conditions. Um, but in any case, I, I ended up doing this performance with this electric breast pump on me, producing absolutely no milk, uh, sitting in front of her portrait, writing a letter to her about how much I had failed her and how much this attempt was preposterous and in vain and would never be able to reach any actual sense of what she was doing, what she was after. So it was in some way about this, this sort of, yeah, this beautiful failure, this, this performance, um, just to try to be close to her, to try to understand what it was to, yeah, to have her life and to have the controversy that she had, that she brought with her. And the, the electric breast pump was very strange also in this space to have plastic surrounded by these, um, yeah, these beautiful remnants of her life. 
the letter ended up being complete nonsense because while I was sitting there, I made a promise to myself that I would just keep typing. I didn't know what was coming, nothing was planned. I would just look at her face and write to her and see, see what would come, see if there was some way for me to genuinely connect with her through this failure. And so I think I just kind of deteriorated into, yeah, <laughs> into babbling. Uh, these, these next couple of pieces are in response. I, I was an artist in residence with a collective called Excavating History, at, again at the International Museum of Surgical Science. And I worked with artist Meredith Silke to try to um, sort of reenact a couple of images that are in the museum there. Uh, also because the models that were often used for medical diagrams are of course in very much in pain and very much anonymous. Uh, nobody knows who these models are, nobody knows anything about their lives. They just become a kind of way to demonstrate a new technology. So this is from a traction device that was built. Um, and then this is, this is from a surgical painting. So all of this is sort of aiming eventually towards a theory of empathy and what empathy does as a creative force because of this permeability. Uh, I, I couldn't stop thinking still somehow about my patients and what I had witnessed working in the psychiatric hospital, the reality of these lives, and I wanted to understand. I thought because I had been somehow in the same institution that I would be able to understand but this is, this is a story that I told myself. It's completely impossible. Everybody's inner world is, is so separate um, as an experience. So I thought, okay, maybe I can try to start to reenact some of the symptoms. Maybe I can use my body to uh, find a way to access the inner state. And so this was a performance in which I, I reenacted one of my patient's um, behavior. She, she spent all of her time kissing the walls of her room, just kissing them, trying to be tender with them, speaking to them. Um, and it felt somehow so related to what I was doing with this building and trying to make something come alive, trying to create intimacy. It didn't work. This again was another failure. It created certainly some kind of trance state, but it didn't work. I, I still found myself no closer. Um, but I, I was definitely aware that there are, mm, there's something powerful about the attempt uh, because it's humbling and somehow the humility is uh, much more of a gift maybe. This led me to try a public performance of autotherapy. I had a phobia of darkness uh, since I was very, very small. And so I set up a situation to create stuckness. I couldn't run from it. I wanted to experience this fear to confront it through um, traditional means for treating phobias. This is immersion therapy where the patient has no ability to escape this confrontation. And so I built a blindfold that locked onto my head um, and the key was hidden in four beds. It was stuffed into mattresses and blankets and pillows and sheets. Uh, 350 keys. Only one of them let me out. And so I wandered around this hall, blindfolded, panicking. Uh, the, the public, they were invited to help. They were given flashlights to tear through everything to try to help me find these things. In the end, I, I was just exhausted. I, I collapsed. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it anymore. The performance was always supposed to be three hours, but the three hours ended, and I still didn't find the key. So um, luckily, I had a sort of nurse there to protect me from damaging myself, and she had a spare. Uh, but this felt a bit like my own medicine, you know, that I was spending so much time around the fragility of others, but it felt like I needed to confront my, my own sense and what it means to be public about this, uh, to be in a performance in which I had no option to perform, in which my ability to project control and to project myself and to hold myself in some way disappears because I'm just simply too overwhelmed. Uh, this performance, it, yeah, it's called Such a Small Thing because it was somehow a very small thing. This lamb 
was scheduled to be slaughtered um, and through, through another very, very beautiful performance uh, by James QB and Katrina Erickson, Chamberlain now, <laughs> sorry, um, who's with us here right now. And uh, so this, was, this lamb was going to be slaughtered as a part of a performance, but, and I was, I was scheduled also to help with this performance and to witness the slaughter of the lamb. And so I asked for permission to spend time with the lamb the night before uh, to see if I could somehow connect with it, bond with it, share something, uh, and how it would feel after finding a way to, to bond with it, how it would feel for that connection to be ripped away, watching its death, bearing witness to it. Uh, and so it was a very simple goal. I just wanted to try to look the lamb in the eyes, uh, just to make contact, and then to see how, how it would feel. And the lamb was used by, by these two other performance artists to, um, to create a very beautiful piece, and, and the whole body was used, but, but the head. The head was not somehow able to be transformed into anything else at that moment, and so I ended up having the head of this lamb in my freezer for months. And this was not intended. This was not part of the plan. I couldn't, I couldn't open my freezer. I knew that it was, I mean, I, I knew this head was in there. I, I couldn't let it go because there was still a chance that something purposeful could be done with it. I wasn't ready to let it go because if it could be turned in, if it could be transformed into something of beauty, something of value for other people, then surely throwing it away would never feel right. Uh, so I eventually, um, eventually it was taken and, and fed to beetles and turned into a skull. And um, so it was, it was in the end used, but I don't know, I mean, I, all of you know something about connection and, and bonds that you make with people and with animals. Is it possible to stage an artificial circumstance in which that can happen? Can you ask that of yourself knowing? This was the question, what, what can I do to create a circumstance? Uh, how, how much can I make myself vulnerable knowing that it's going to be sacrificed? I wasn't sure, and I'm still not sure, I mean, I, I was, I was terrified watching the slaughter, but it somehow felt nice knowing that it, I had some connection. Yeah, this is un completely unanswered. Um, <clears throat> this piece, I laugh because this piece really took over my life for some time. Something about the process, partially of watching this lamb bleed, watching um, the blood leave, got me interested in, in the membrane of the body and how the body leaks, and how the body leaks especially when it's overwhelmed, like crying or like sweating, when there's a, an experience that can't be contained by the body. And so I started visiting several places that people go to when their body leaks, or in order for their body to be able to leak, like porno theaters. Um, I visited porno theaters and began collecting the tissues that people use to wipe up uh, semen after masturbating, and I visited emergency rooms and collected homemade bandages that people were using uh, before they received medical treatment for wounds, and I visited the emergency rooms of psychiatric hospitals, and then I also started visiting funerals of strangers and collecting the tissues that people were using to cry. And the other venues began to fall away because somehow they were creating these interactions which were not bringing me any closer to the experience of the people there. But I found something in these funerals, even though I was a visitor, even though nobody knew me, uh, suddenly I was able to be around this group of strangers who were all weeping together. And because I wasn't known so much as an outsider, I could find space to allow myself to cry as well and to feel somehow something, to let something go. I only had one experience that was very difficult, a confrontation. Um, yeah, sometimes during these things, you know, you, you end up with stories about the anomalies uh, and the ethical crises that come with being involved in other people's lives. I went to a funeral in which I was the only person who was unaccounted for by someone who had very close friends, very tight-knit family, and the, the wife of the man who died assumed that I was a mistress of her husband who had passed, and this created uh, 
the, this was the last funeral I attended uh, because it was, it was much too much to manage. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, am I a bit embarrassed that these things happen? Does it feel a bit incorrect? Yes, somehow it does. And I have to be honest about that because it's real. And this is the risk that you take when you start working with real things. Um, but I also felt like, okay, maybe if I can create evidence of what these, these people are going through, other people can connect. It can be a connection point. Death is something everybody shares. It's, it's a universal force. It's a recognition of the way that life passes for us all. So I, I carried on, but at that moment, this, this yeah, this interaction, I, I couldn't continue afterwards. So I took these tissues, and I took notes. I, I had a notebook that I was using to write uh, what people were doing physically while they were um, crying and while they were in this, this atmosphere, trying to establish the relationship that people had to the person who had passed. And so for instance, for this one that's in focus here, I'll just read this. Wife, early 50s. She's standing next to the guest book. She shakes several people's hands while gripping a tissue in her left. Her face is wet. She is smiling towards e each person as she touches them. Once they have walked past her, she turns from the doorway. She places her hands on her hips and inhales deeply. She coughs, then turns back. So when these were exhibited, uh, you can see here that, that the tissues uh, are stained. I sent them to a biochemical lab to have them treated with a chromatic stain so that the tears would be visible on, on the Kleenex and, and on one handkerchief. And then there was an audio of all of the observations being read from each of these tissues. Bedtime stories. After the experience of doing these kind of covert performances with strangers, uh, in groups and then dealing with a sort of public exhibition with strangers who somehow know exactly what's going on. I, I decided I'd had enough <laughs> of groups. I wanted to see what it would be like to make a performance for one person. So I, I set up uh, a call on Craigslist to offer to tuck people in and to read them a bedtime story. And from the people who responded, uh, I interviewed them over email before setting up an appointment and asked them to tell me their childhood fears and their adulthood fears. And then I wrote them a bedtime story, a fairy tale. I made them a book and I showed up at their house with a kit. Um, I made them milk tea with honey and I put a brick in the oven to warm it and wrapped it in a cloth and put it at the bottom of their bed and went through a rather archaic, but still somehow very genuine ritual that I experienced as a child with my grandparents. And I sat next to their bed and put the blankets over them and tucked them in and read them their story and left the book for them and walked out. Uh, I did this with 13 people. They all fell into three very distinct categories. Um, one, which is probably very expected, would be the adult children of elderly parents who are caring for their parents and simply um, want their parents to have company, want some kind of outside communication. Uh, and so I would come to be with them. And, and in that case, all of the communication happened through the child. Uh, I think every, everyone, all, all of the elderly people I sat with, I think they all had Alzheimer's or, or advanced dementia. It was not totally clear how much of the story they followed, but they seemed very happy by my presence there. Um, the second group were uh, parents of adult children with disabilities, um, an adult child with um, autism. Uh, and for, yeah, the parents just, I think, wanted a break in these cases. There was one woman who left me with her child and just didn't come home until three in the morning. And I could see that this, this was somehow just a, about respite care and about giving a pause to the parents. And the third group uh, was the biggest surprise, though I feel a bit naive for saying so, were men looking for erotic encounters and thinking that this was a sort of disguised way of experiencing some kind of fetish. Uh, <laughs> 
These were somehow hilarious, never dangerous, luckily, um, but I think very disappointing for these men. <laughs> uh, and, and there were a couple of moments I was, I was thrown out of one guy's place once he finally sort of got that nothing he thought was going to happen was going to happen. Um, but I think the, the results of those is, was mostly embarrassment for both parties, uh, though, though with, with some sense of humor. After working with these performances, uh, I was clearly collecting a series of experiences that were a bit strange and asking myself, okay, what is it that I'm inviting into my life and how can I start to think about my art practice in a way that makes it feel um, <laughs> not so risky or self-destructive or questionable uh, and also how can I make friends with the difficult moments that I have during these encounters. So, I started with this, this idea of what is the role of my practice in my life and started thinking of my practice as a person. Uh, I've called this the plus one theory. Uh, first, the idea is that you invite your practice into your life. So I started thinking of my practice as a house guest and decided, okay, if it's affecting me so deeply then I need to draw boundaries. There are social protocols to hospitality. So maybe I should begin to observe them. <laughs> maybe there are parts of my life in certain rooms and certain interactions where my practice isn't allowed to live, like a house guest. <laughs> Generally, you know, there are some sometimes rules with these things. Um, then I began thinking of the art practice once it goes into the public realm and imagining that if I exhibit something, then the practice is like a plus one to a party and then I'm responsible for caring for the practice as well as for the public and introducing them. This led me to develop a practice of conducting, I'm sorry for the glitch on the slide here, couples counseling for artists and their practices. Uh, so I worked for four months with 47 artists conducting couples counseling in which they personify their art practice and give it a voice and have arguments and uh, psychodramatic uh, moments with whatever is coming up. I mean, some um, part of this was a process of transposition, so I asked them to imagine, okay, what if your, if you, if you think of your art practice as a person, what kind of person would this be? What kind of character would it be? My favorite example of this was a stowaway uh, in their life, but also you, I had colic children and, um, a boss and I mean lots of things but in the end it was really about giving voice to something and trying to imagine what negotiation means with uh, with the habits that you form and the things that you make. Um, through that I found artistic research which I don't I don't know how much artistic research is kind of covered here. Um, this is a process that resists the object. It resists resolution, it resists product. Uh, so I, I moved to Belgium to be able to work with it because it's not so popular here. Um, I went to a research institute in Brussels called A Pass, in which I went in under the heading of the body in control of losing control. This was the proposed research. It certainly had something to do with this question of vulnerability because somehow in order to summon vulnerability you have to enter into the unknown and in the unknown you always lose some sense of control since there's no ability to expect or anticipate, prepare anything. The most logical step somehow after explicitly saying that I'm interested in the consensual loss of control was to begin to look into alternative sexual practices. Uh, BDSM, sadomasochism, dominance, bondage, these things, this, this world has a whole collection, a whole lexicon of practices and experiences that deal with this directly. So I entered into the, yeah, the kink community in Belgium and found partners with which to explore and to document these experiences. Uh, this is what's referred to as breath play, which is another person um, taking control over my ability to breathe. And this was done in preparation for a performance called The Water Cure, in which I was waterboarded um, almost exactly where waterboarding was invented. It was invented during the Flemish Inquisition. Uh, and uh, yeah, 
I, I'm, I would say that um, the experience is very real. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever experienced such an intense resilience before, but yeah, it's terrifying. It's, it's entirely about loss of control because it's, it's about the ultimate loss of control, uh, the experience of, of your own mortality. It was somehow, it was done in very safe conditions. I had a member of the Red Cross there monitoring and um, it took place over the period, over a period of 45 minutes. The full thing, everyone here is familiar with the process of waterboarding, roughly, okay. Um, so in the end we stopped because I was showing signs of, of um, hypothermia because of the space that we were in. Um, but I was surprised by the level of calm that follows this experience, and it felt somehow ecstatic that I had left my body uh, behind, and I felt a sense of release. And I wanted to know more about what that could be. I'm going to skip this for the moment. Uh, so I, I started this research that, I, <laughs> that has become this book um, called Ectopia, which is about states of ecstasy, and how I can try to induce moments where I lose contact with the here and now, with time, with language, with other people, that I use my body as a mechanism to attempt uh, to leave somehow, to disappear. Because I think we're a bit pressed for time, I'm going to skip through the methodology, though I'm happy to share it with anybody who would like me to forward it. Um, I, I used a spectrum of, of four categories for this idea of lapsed attachment, uh, time, place, language, and others, and created a kind of typology of ectopic creatures. Ectopia means outside of placement. Um, so this is a kind of catalog of different physical and internal experiences, and they have some kind of creature attached to them to begin this typology. This was my experience of exhaustion, attempting to induce exhaustion. I'll just read through this. I didn't realize that I would be so far from the monitor, so excuse my turned head. So for this performance, I paced back and forth across a wall with a pencil in my hand. Uh, the, the, the intention was to just do this until I dropped, until I fell asleep. Um, and I just pressed it lightly on the paper and paced. I took one step for each inhalation, one step for each exhalation. Uh, the paper is 10 steps long. Each hour, on the hour, an alarm would sound. And when I heard this alarm, I would continue to the end of the paper, remove a dictaphone from my pocket, take one step, one inhalation, and then on the exhalation, I would speak one line of text into the dictaphone, whatever came. Always starting with, there is a bed. I completed one length of the wall, so that's five exhalations, five lines, and I repeated it each hour until I collapsed. There's a bed, it has four legs, a front and a back. It is uncovered, it is being left. Again, to save time, I don't think I'll read the whole thing, but you can see that eventually it just deteriorates into there's a bed, no, pocket, two, no. <laughs> and at that point, I have not much idea what happened except that I woke up um, not so much longer on the floor um, with, a, with a very swollen knee. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a meditation. I mean, people do walking meditations all the time. It's not such an unusual practice. Uh, but generating text during this gave me some idea of tracking the way that language leaves as the body begins to experience something unusual. In the end, this experience, this, the experiment of Ectopia was, was about trying to find a way to create evidence, to create evidence of these bodily states because they are so resistant to language. This was about um, my fear. The methodology has a lot to do with following fear because of the unknown, because of panic. Uh, and this was my fear of anger. I tried to induce anger and again failed miserably in that moment. Um, 
the idea was to break glass until I somehow, the action, the violence of the action of breaking glass would maybe summon something in me, but it didn't work. Uh, and then several months later, for the first time in my life, I threw an object to break it in a totally genuine state of, of anger. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I suppose that I must have been able to condition myself through the attempt speculation. This is an experience of, of forced stillness. You can see that there's, there's the dictaphone by my head there. So while I was in this rap, this is mummification. It's a traditional um, experience in the kink community, I would say at this point. Uh, I had a dictaphone there, and the transcript is, is, in, is in the book um, of what I experienced over the course of about an hour and a half of being mummified. Also, a laughing fit. Laughing fits are certainly ectopic states, <laughs> um, even if only for the oxygen deprivation. <laughs> um, this is a slide from James Elkins. The book started to explore collaboration as a loss of control, so I invited, uh, in the end, I have 24 contributors for the book for the process of this research. Um, and so James Elkins was, was uh, I asked him to respond to pain and I sent him a prompt on the subject of pain and this is his, the, the result of his response. I will read one thing to you uh, because I feel like it gives something of an essence of the, of the process of dealing with research and dealing with language and trying to work through transposition, uh, I was asked by um, a colleague at the Institute to describe my research practice to them as if it were a house to displace it from the intellectualism that surrounds research by thinking of it as a house. My house is forever under construction. I'm a sleepwalker, dreaming that I'm awake. I want to be awake. I've set traps for myself. I'm roused each time to find that I have at least one dozen new rooms in my house that I never knew were there. They are furnished with objects, only vaguely familiar, they are furnished with words. I live the life of a narcoleptic. I get lost in my house every hour. I can't remember which room I sleep best in. I wander, I have dozens of beds. In half, there is a man or a woman sleeping. They sing in their separate sleeps. They invite me in. My house has a choir of sleepers waiting. The room with empty beds are cold. Sometimes I prefer the cold. I fill 20 rubber bottles full of hot water and stack them in a barricade to lean against. I cover the barricade in fur. I am pretending. I am pushing out the cold. My house has one kitchen only, one hearth. No one else is allowed to enter the kitchen except the animals who nest there. My kitchen is beautiful. My kitchen is wooden. I'm carving it. I use the wood shavings for the fire. I use the sawdust to feed the plants. Every hallway is a greenhouse. I've installed ropes and a passage through the center of the halls in order to avoid damaging the plants while I'm sleepwalking. They are very dear to me. I nuzzle them, we rub noses, I pollinate, I have no closets. I spend nearly all of my time asleep, setting traps to wake myself. They are becoming more elaborate. No, that's not true. They were once very elaborate. Now they are simple. They are becoming more effective. They trip me, they catch me, I do not fall. I come to my knees, I wake in prayer. I wake with a flush. Sometimes I wake at the foot of my bed weeping. I live in fear that I will wake like this before a bed that is occupied and will have to face the person under the blanket. This fear keeps me warm. I'm always barefoot. My house has an attic and a basement, but these, are, these spaces have rules. I must only climb to the attic blindfolded. I guide myself. I must only descend to the basement gagged. I must tell it what I want in some other way. I must allow it to hold me. I do not go down there. I stand at the door and watch down the stairs for something to move. 
The inhabitants of my house never arrive through the front door. They appear in their beds while I am sleeping. I dream of opening the gate. I dream of someone ringing the bell. I dream also of leaving. I've set snare traps all around the front door to wake myself before I leave. Sometimes I can't find the front door. Where's my front door? So you can see that this is, yeah, it's a poetic text. It's not intellectual at all. This was somehow the point that I needed to find a way to open to some um, fragility of my own because in the process of going through all of these ectopic experiences, all of these trials of the body, uh, I began hiding in the mind and I lost sight of um, how important it is to keep myself open if I'm going to treat myself as my own material for sculpting, if I'm going to um, try these methods of transformation on myself, then I have to find a way to be sincere and to be fragile in my sincerity, to recognize my limits. Poetry became the way out of this. It became the way for me to be able to witness what I was doing on a level um, that I wasn't able to hide or run from because the intellect can be a very safe place for hiding. Uh, so this is where I am now. Uh, the book is under revision. It will be published in a couple of months. And um, it led me, this, this process and the poetics that emerged accidentally from them, led me to my current project, uh, which is the creation of a sanctuary for artistic research and process-based practices in the city of Monton in France. It's in a former monastery. We have secured the building now, um, and in the, res the renovation will start in a month. Uh, but I could see somehow that artists need to have a space to deal with their questions openly, to be able to resist resolution, uh, to have support and uh, a place of safety if they're going to be able to ask difficult questions and to not have to run away, to not have to sort of plague themselves with professional expectations of what artists should look like and what artists should do and produce. So this is, this is the idea. This is where I'm headed. That's all. Thank you. Questions? How do, you, how do you go about getting funding for all these various projects? A lot of the funding has come through residencies. Um, a lot of it is self-funded. Um, because I'm not making objects that are particularly saleable, I, I mean, also, uh, lots of these experiences aren't particularly expensive to make either. Um, funding is not so much of a problem. The problem is more so the question of audience how do I find an audience that I can connect with? How do I find uh, people to, to bridge, to share with? Um, I, I, I have some experience with having received grants and certainly institutional support. And yeah, I mean, you, I do what everyone does. I write proposals. <laughs> um, I find that somehow this form of radical sincerity where I can just sit down and really tell people what I'm actually interested in because I realize I'm dealing with subjects that are not... Um, often considered the proper jurisdiction of the art world, you know, healing and therapy and religion and sex, these are usually not so welcome presences very often. <laughs> so, uh, but I do find that if I'm able to be really upfront and direct with people about what I do and what I want and what I ask of it, more often than not the answer is yes because people spend so much time trying to sell, trying to sell and sell and sell the idea and sell the importance and sell the politics and if, if I just approach a person as a person, somehow it's very successful. Does that answer the question? Why, why do you see certain realms um, kind of off limits uh, for, for artists or some of the work in your experience? Or why do you think in, in a sociological sense you see that? Well, um, sex is rather easy, right? Sex makes people uncomfortable in general. Um, 
this, I mean, this is a different level of social taboo wherever you are in the world. There are different codes, different social codes. And sex can be fine because provocation somehow has a bit of distance to it very often. If you know something is going to be controversial, it's sometimes even easier to put it far from you to protect yourself, you know? Uh, therapy, I would say, is actually the thing that people want to touch the least um, because it feels maybe soft somehow. Art therapy and art production, in my experience, have an enormous gap between them. And I have often been asked by people, okay, is what you're doing art therapy? And it's not art therapy in a way. I'm really, I'm not looking to use, um, to, to introduce a creative process in order to heal. I'm, I'm looking to use the creative process in order to sculpt myself and to offer experiences that transform. And transformation is not the same as healing in the end. It's really explorative. Uh, but as soon as people hear therapy, I think sometimes they imagine that that I'm working in a, in a different realm, so it becomes confusing. There are, of course, artists who, who are working directly with therapy and autotherapeutic practice in their work, but yeah, I, th I would say that there's a bit of prejudice against it. Um, as soon as you get other people involved, also there's a question of ethics uh, and the reality of, of the lives that you touch. Um, this can also create controversy. I don't think that these subjects are outside of of bounds at all, clearly. I mean, I'm, I'm fully invested in keeping, um, keeping things as boundless as possible, but I have encountered some resistance, sure. As far as religion, I, religion is always a controversial issue. I don't, I don't know anywhere that it isn't a controversial issue. <laughs> so um, it, it, when you deal with the politics of inclusion and exclusion, you're going to find lines, and as soon as the lines are there, if you, if you decide you want to step over them and to claim like, I'm, I'm not Catholic, I have no experience with Catholicism, but somehow my work is deeply involved in the Catholic narrative and history. I have no right to that, and I acknowledge that, but it's still material that's, that's in the world. So, yeah, I would say, what, where, is a, where is your space of belonging? What do you have the right to talk about? Um, again, if, if I just go into it with humility and say, I'm here because I'm curious and I want to ask questions, I, th I think it gives people a, a bit of comfort in my intentions because I don't really have any interest in doing anything other than asking and seeing. I'll answer anything, guys, and I'll be perfectly honest about it. <laughs> Could you talk more about that ethical issue you mentioned? Um, you're going into the lives of people. You mentioned Alzheimer's victims. You mentioned people with children who are somehow damaged, mm -hmm. um, and you're using them as a, an art project. So what are the ethical issues for you and ultimately for them? Mm -hmm. I would say that actually the this, this storybooks, um, I don't feel any ethical issue there at all because those performances were, were never shared and they never will be shared. They, they were specifically made for that person that person isn't being used, that person is the audience, and they invited it, that interaction. Um, that doesn't feel like it even borders on exploitative for me because, because they become the public uh, rather than the subject. This makes it a bit different. Is there any follow up? What happens once you've left that situation, that scenario? Once I, once I left, nothing happens. I, 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 no, I, I, mean, I don't mean publicly, I mean yeah. to that person. Ah, to the person. Well, they, they I mean, every, everyone had the ability to continue to contact me if they like. Um, I, was, I was, by, by the, the parents or the, the caretaking children, I was thanked by all of them. Uh, but I think it's also because I have experience working with people who have disabilities and working with people um, who have dementia, I, I, that I, I know something about care and about caretaking and about safety precautions. and. Uh, so because I have this clinical background that was introduced to me, um, I felt perfectly safe and capable. And other than the experience I had with the men who were expecting a sexual encounter, um, I had a really, yeah, a really beautiful exchange. Um, I would say that if, if anything, 
causes me to feel um, an ongoing sense of ethical crisis. It's my experience with the funerals. Yeah, of, of being an interloper in, in this um, moment of such severe exposure. Uh, and this is not something uh, that feels reconcilable to me, except to say that it's a space of permission, that funerals are a space of permission, and that um, I was genuinely present and genuinely touched, uh, and was, was not in, interested in any way in interfering. Um, and of course, there's always, I mean, with, with the ethics of this, there's, there's always a strong commitment to preserving the anonymity of the people involved. That's very important to me, yeah. Why, like, what brought you to the mental hospital? Uh, when I was a teenager, yeah, I, I had very, very severe insomnia for years um, that created psychosis in me because I wasn't resting, and I had traumatic experiences as a young child that created this insomnia. Um, so between the insomnia and the uh, daytime hallucinations that would that result from it for anyone who experiences a severe sleep deprivation and also through panic attacks. Yeah. What was the significance of or the the role in asking for the adult and childhood fears of the the bedtime story. Mm. Good question. Um, I have a strong relationship to fairy tales because of the way that they've been treated historically and also the fantasy of them, of course, the, the whimsy. Um, and reading a bedtime story is also somehow an act of, of, of comfort and reassurance about um, your position in the world. Fairy tales historically have often been used. Uh, in fact, I think several, yeah, I mean, Theorists uh, like Jack Zipes, for instance, talks about um, the, the purpose that fairy tales serve in the way of introducing and resolving, providing solutions to fears. And so it had a bit to do with the form, with using the bedtime story, which has traditionally, at least for me, been a fairy tale. Um, so yeah, in, in the stories, I, I tried to introduce elements of both the childhood and the adulthood fear in a kind of journey and in, in a conversation so that they could be linked and then provided something like the happy ending in which whatever angst was caused by the presence of them um, could at least be experienced narratively as having passed or um, been solved or uh, at least <laughs> wrapped up in a tidy, <laughs> beautiful way. Um, it, was, it was genuinely about providing comfort somehow, yeah. Where do you feel like your work is uh, headed now, so after this book? Yeah, after the book, um, I, I feel like somehow the process of engaging in artistic research and the process of these ecstatic experiments dissolved any boundary that existed for me between art and life. <laughs> that at this point, I, I'm mostly interested in living artfully, and that for me means becoming a host. Um, I'm right now conducting research on magic, magic, um, magic and magic with a K. I don't know if you're familiar with magic with a K, <laughs> uh, but the idea that somehow performance practice is potentially situated between these things. You have a world of illusion and theatricality and you have a world of, of ritual and a sincere attempt to transform. And for me, performance feels a bit in the, in the middle of this. So I have research that's ongoing uh, but I would say that my purpose for right now is really in trying to create a space for people to ask questions safely because I feel, I've experienced and I feel that there's so much pressure in the art community to, to resolve, to produce, to fabricate, and 
Um, I want to make sure that people who long to have a place where questions can live freely and sort of roam like, like free-range cattle <laughs> and just collect nourishment that, that this is still possible. Some of these projects fall with an element of risk. Have you ever been, had your friends try to talk you out of something? Oh, yes. And have you second guessed yourself? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I've also been made very ill from several projects, and uh, yeah, I, th I think, I can't remember how many times in grad school I heard people tell me that my practice is not sustainable. Um, and I've had very concerned friends and concerned parents and concerned partners. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've been very, very fortunate. But I will say that in the process of, of this of this book and of, of asking especially things from my body, very physical things. You know, I've been in the process of making this book for two and a half years now, the research for it. And the first year and a half was production and the last year has been therapy. <laughs> therapy in different, in different varieties, but really about trying to digest and integrate and heal from some of the experiences and what's come from them. Um, I couldn't even start revising the book until I had given myself enough space to be fully present with the things that happened. Because somehow in the process of production, I had so much momentum and so much desire to try and to learn and to see and to find that I forgot to care for myself. I forgot to give myself space to, to be present with, with what I felt and what was and what lived in me. And, um, so yes, I mean, with some of these things, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think that as long as I keep approaching everything as, um, as a teacher, that all of these experiences are somehow my teachers, uh, then, then there's no possibility that anything can go wrong somehow because I'm always learning. And I'm always learning, especially to trust myself more, to trust that I'm able to handle, and that I'm able to find a way, um, and that the resourcefulness comes if I can stay open to what, what I'm actually in and what I'm actually experiencing, what I'm actually asking of myself and other, of other people. Um, there was a slide that we rushed through. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know a little more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The um, when I started exploring these different facets of what I call Ectopia, this kind of invented lands where I imagine I escape to when I'm in ecstasy, <laughs> um, I, I I separated the experiences of getting there in into these attachments, the attachment to time, to place, language, and identity, or the world of other people, and. Uh, and so I started exploring, okay, what happens if somebody is removed a bit from language and there are lots of people who live in the world and don't experience language the way that most people experience language? Um, I, I did a series of interviews with other artists to discuss these things, but I, I, I call them ectopic creatures uh, and I, f I find that this creaturehood is actually able to offer an enormous amount of insight onto the assumptions that we carry invisibly about our relationship to these attachments. Because when you, when you live with these attachments fully intact and fully in place, you tend to forget that they're there. But everybody has a night when they get ridiculously drunk and they find themselves without a sense of language, time, or space. I mean, it's, it's something that's shared. We all have these lapses occasionally. I just want to treat them as opportunities to be able to have insight into the way that I, I instrumentalize these attachments daily. Um, so there's something to learn for me from ectopic creatures. Um, and I mean, there, it's, it's also, I mean, it's a bit cheeky. It's a bit of a joke that I'm calling them ghosts and zombies. And yeah, it's, it's, there's a sense of humor in there somewhere. <laughs> and that the, the monster, like, um, the, the, the icon of the monster is the person who exists without attachments to any of these things. And I'm, I'm sort of attempting somehow through these practices to turn myself temporarily into a monster because I want to have freedom and monsters somehow have freedom because they don't have expectations imposed on them anymore. Um, and there's something beautiful about the freedom that you can find in these things, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'm curious about your um, process of researching mm -hmm. as to whether or not it's mostly an internal process or more external or combination. Um, yeah, it's it's. Um it's got lots of facets, I would say. I mean, I do textual research like most people do textual research. I find authors that have relevant theories and I do that sort of typical thing. So put that aside. Uh, <laughs> in addition to that, though, it's somehow like the, the methodology for this was about following fear uh, because I felt like, okay, if I'm afraid, then I must be in front of the unknown, which means, okay, transformations may be possible then. So I, I located my fears and then I found collaborators who were willing to create circumstances in, in which I could experience them and experience them safely. Um, so I would say that the, the sort of actionist aspect is part of it too. This is external and collaborative. Uh, there were also other physical things, yeah, like exhaustion or purgation. I went through a round of vomiting over and over and over again. I had a major fear of vomiting. So I, I think it's just about asking myself the things that I resist the most. You know, I had, um, a, a poetry teacher my freshman year of college who told us on our first assignment that she wanted us to write about what we were most afraid to talk about. And somehow this stuck with me. And the methodology has somehow come from this attitude. Uh, collaboration as a methodology is, um, is full of surprises. And so especially in, in an attempt to lose control makes perfect sense. I don't know, I, I, think, um, I think I'm always open to how research could look because somehow living is a kind of research if you, if you come to it with a pair of glasses where your questions become the thing that guide you. Um, so maybe it's about dissolving these lines, I don't know. Yeah. Does that answer at all? Okay. Are your collaborators sort of always in the know of what you're doing or is it no, no. For instance, I didn't. I, I did a kind of um, performative experiment when I shortly after I moved to Belgium. That I was inviting, I was inviting strangers to come and stay at my flat for the weekend, and would defer to them on every decision. But I didn't tell them. So whenever it was time to decide what to do, I simply found a way to convince them to make the decision. But they had no idea that I was always saying yes. They had no idea that I w had already created a substructure in which they would always get whatever they wanted. Um, clearly, there were reasons to not tell them that this was the case. Um, yeah, so uh, yes, they, people don't always know it. There, there are often yeah, very covert aspects to what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm sorry, I really need for you to use the microphone if you can. Hi. Which one is your major trauma? And have you ever attacked it directly through your art? Mm -hmm. and, and also, from a personal point of view, with neither, um, sorry, it's not my main language, uh, with not the direct participation of others. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part. With, with no direct participation of others. Mm -hmm. Which one is your major trauma? Have you ever that, uh, attacked that trauma directly throughout your art and without participation of others? Because I've seen that mostly it relates always to a second person, to mm -hmm. an other, in order for you to get out your, your, your personal situations outside. Mm -hmm or even you being the receptor of other people, even in context of manipulation, mm -hmm. psychological manipulation. Mm -hmm. So have you ever go like bare naked against this psychological trauma that you may have or not, mm -hmm. I'm just supposing, and, and attack it di directly through your art? Yeah, I, I can't tell quite if you're asking about traumas that have existed in my life prior to my practice, or yeah. if you're talking about traumas that have come from performance. No, no, no. I am in sort of way after the performance is suspected. If it's, I'm, I'm saying the first traumas. First traumas, before you, like yeah. in my childhood or something. Yeah. Yeah. Before or before you start to be an artist. No, no, not necessarily mm -hmm. you. 
childhood, or you declare yourself a rarist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I went through four years of sexual abuse when I was uh, between the ages of eight and 12, and this was where my art practice started. I, I My first degree is in critical theory, actually, uh, and I decided at some point, okay, maybe I'll try this art thing, because I loved objects and making with my hands, and, and so um, I did a post-baccalaureate at MICA, in which I had spent the whole year committed only to making work on my own that was directly related to the sexual abuse. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, this commitment to myself, it, it was in some way self-conducted art therapy in a way because it, it could externalize. Um, and I, and I, I have to say that I feel very healed by the experience of that externalization and especially dealing with beauty and dealing with aesthetics and dealing with objects that can make something that felt damaging or destructive uh, into a mirror where I'm able to see something positive that's come from it. Um, but yeah, it was, it was immersion, it was absolute immersion and I think that was the first time that I felt free from my need to uh, distance and control through using my mind and through using philosophy and words and language to keep everything apart. Um, there's still something, yeah, you, you, this opening up that happens, I, I think of it sort of the way that open heart surgery is conducted, that you have to be kind of pried open sometimes, and it takes, at moments, a bit of force and a bit of determination and um, to, yeah, to allow yourself to, to feel, to really feel and to step away from uh, cultural conditioning and expectations, especially this issue of success. Um, so I gave myself, I sort of gifted myself an, an incubation phase, I would say. Yeah, does that answer your question? In some sense. Okay. In fact, it gives me another question. Okay. <laughs> Do you believe in post-traumatic growth? Sorry. Do you believe in post-traumatic growth? That you have growth after that, even that horrible trauma that you had yeah, in the sure. post? And I that think you, it, sorry, the last part mm -hmm. of the question. And also that helped to broad your perception of life mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe in, in the possibility of growth with everything. I don't, I mean, whether it's traumatic or whether um, it's getting a, a paper cut or whether it's walking outside for breath of fresh air, I think every, everything is, is a possibility. Everything is a possible resource. Everything is an opportunity. Uh, the only thing is that different experiences give you um, different access to new information. And the issue with trauma is that even on a survival level, the instinct is to protect yourself, it's to close, because you're threatened. And so somehow, I think art making is, is, a, is a real possible tool in this case. You have to override that impulse in order for it to become a moment of growth. And I think that, I mean, I, I, I was a, a counselor for, for, I guess, collectively maybe three years, a volunteer counselor running group therapy for people with post-traumatic stress. And so I, I've, seen, I've seen the success stories and I've also seen the people who just shut down from the world because they weren't able to break through the protection that they felt they needed in order to be safe. Um, the question is really like, how do you build a resource from these experiences? And the question I started this talk with is like, okay, I had this experience. What does that make me uniquely qualified to do? If I have this experience and I'm, and I'm able to see it as a window um, or a doorway that I can walk through in order to find other people and to offer something, I think service is somehow the, the way that I have found to deal with creating the bridge to growth. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys.